ask you this. How many of you guys are already done with your Christmas shopping? Would you go ahead and raise your hands? Okay, for, uh, keep your hands raised right now. For all of you who don't have your Christmas shopping done, would you repeat after me? Boo! Um, well, I, I love the Christmas time. My family loves the Christmas time. Not only because of the sights and the sounds and the smells and the tastes that come from Christmas. And I, and I know that you feel the same way. Christmas is really the ha happiest time of the year where everything just kind of magically comes together in the end, doesn't it? I mean, after all, this is the time where the Grinch's heart grew three times that day. This is that time where Rudolph's nose grew so bright that he guided Santa's sleigh at night. This is the time where at the end of It's a Wonderful Life, uh, the entire town comes together in order to support George Bailey. That out of, this is our mentality, that out of, the, out of all of the horrendous days that life has a tendency to deal us throughout the year, that we're just looking for one momentary reprieve. That we're not even looking for one month as if, you know, as if that's mu too much to ask to have just one month go our way, a season go our way. We're not even looking for one week. We're just looking for one day where the kids aren't fighting with one another. We're just looking for one day where the family gets along at our Christmas gathering. We're looking for one day where we don't have to worry about the money that we're going to spend or the saturated fats that we're about to consume. Zoom. Now y'all probably don't understand what I'm saying because you're just sitting there like you, like you don't even understand anything. But, uh, and, and, and this is my fear as your pastor, that sometimes, that sometimes we end up setting ourselves up for disappointment just because our expectations are just way too high for Christmas, aren't they? I mean, can I tell you this? Uh, uh, that, that for me, that's definitely the case. You know why? Because um, on Christmas morning, you know, the kids are up early and, you know, the Lee family is expecting to have this wonderfully amazing time when all of a sudden daddy starts suffering from something that I call rap rage. Do you know what rap rage is? I'm not talking about rap like as in yo, 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 boy. <laughs> Not talking about like, you guys like that? Is that good? Got more where that, I got more where that comes from. Um, I'm not talking about that kind of rap as much as I'm talking about the rage that comes from these, uh, the, the, it's impossible to open these toys from the box. You know, I, I, w I wake up early on Christmas morning. Daddy is hungry. Daddy is tired from doing five Christmas services. And then all of a sudden, you cannot get these toys out of the box. And I absolutely, Daddy gets so grumpy when that happens. And for you, that may be just the tip of the iceberg. I know some people who have said this about Christmas, that you know what, Mark, I mean, Christmas is all fine and dandy, but I just try and, I just try and make it through the holidays. You know what, Mark, I just try and tolerate the Christmas time. Because there are so many things in life that are hard enough to deal with on a normal calendar year, let alone to deal with a divorce. Around the Christmas time? Like, you're kidding me. I mean, that's not right. I mean, and to, to deal with a death in the family, I mean, that's hard enough to deal with on a normal day, let alone to deal with that around the Christmas time. And whereas last year where the Christmas table was full, now you just have one empty chair. One empty chair of someone who's not going to be there this year at Christmas. And it's always during that time that I think it's so important for us, for us as Christians and even if you're not a Christian, I want to almost kind of invite you to have this perspective during the holiday season that especially for us as Christians to be able to take a step back and to really almost kind of remember what this Christmas time is all about. We're going to go right into the scriptures this morning. If you have your Bibles this morning, would you turn to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2 verses 1 through 3. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Can we do this? Can we all stand as we honor the reading of God's word this morning? Matthew 
Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, and then we're going to go ahead and jump down to verse 7. Matthew chapter 2, it says this, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Verse 3, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he called together all the chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. Uh, let's go ahead and skip down to verse 7, shall we? Verse 7 says this, Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Verse 9, After they heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their tres treasures and presented to him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. You guys can go ahead and have a seat this morning. What we're going to do this morning is we're going to talk about, in particular, in this story, two different characters that we see. And let's first talk about King Herod. What you have to understand about King Herod is that King Herod wasn't even as much of a king as much as he was a governor over this region of Judea. Judea was mostly a Jewish area, so he was this governor over a mostly Jewish area and what you'll find is that for the most part King Herod was a pretty good leader. I mean not only did he pioneer a lot of these building projects that you see in the area, but especially there was this time uh, that was called the Great Famine around 31 BC, I think somewhere in there. And King Herod, what he did was he took the gold from his own palace and he liquidated all of that in order to help feed all the starving people in his area. So not a bad guy all in all, right? Now, King Herod had, you know, a weakness, like, you and I both have weaknesses. You know, some people suffer from chronic arthritis. Some people struggle with, I don't know, bad breath or something like that. But King Herod's weakness just so came in the area of, I don't know, like, um, killing people. You know, he was always killing people. Like, if you ever questioned his authority, you would be killed. If you ever threatened his kingdom or his position, you would be killed. What you will find, what you would find is the fact that King Herod was a very insecure, very suspicious, very paranoid leader. And so when he took over, the Roman Senate very aptly gave him the nickname. You know what his nickname was? The King of the Jews. So all of a sudden, isn't it ironic that all of a sudden you have these magi that are coming from the east. They go and they knock on King Herod's door. And what do they ask him? They ask him this question. Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? What you have to understand is that Herod, her, er, 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 Herod worked his entire life trying to earn that title. Herod worked his entire life trying to protect that title. And with one little question and with one fell swoop, all of that was taken away from him. And the Bible says this in verse 3, that all of a sudden that, oh, that Herod was disturbed. That didn't sit very well with him. And so what does he do? Herod goes out and he orders the military to go out and kill every baby boy underneath the age of two years old. Now, first of all, what I want to do is I want to talk about the person with the attitude or the person or the attitude who is openly hostile towards Christmas. 
Now, you may not necessarily be the one who wants to, you know, ban the, the saying Merry Christmas, that everybody has to be so politically correct to say Happy Holidays. You may not necessarily want, you know, all Christmas carols to be done away with. You may not necessarily want the banning of all nativity scenes from every street corner, but maybe at some point, someone has accused you of being a little bit Scrooge-like. You know, that you're not really looking for, forward to the Christmas season. Can I tell you this? Honestly, if there's any attitude that I kind of struggle with, it's, it's this one right here. Because you, if you were a fly on the wall of my house, you would probably at some point this Christmas season hear a conversation that went something like this. Do we really have to go to my family's place for Christmas? I mean, come on, my family is crazy. I'm surprised that we're still married here. Yeah, I, I mean, my family knows that I'm a pastor. They're going to ask me to pray at the Christmas dinner. Do I really, come on, do we really have to go to that? Or at some point, you might have heard me say something like, you know, do we really have to spend so much money on Christmas? I mean, the kids aren't going to even play with those toys after Martin Luther King holiday. And so, that's really a lot of money. I mean, okay, okay, maybe you can buy a couple oranges for the kids. But you and me, let's just not get presents for each other. I mean, you can get a present for me, but maybe I just, yeah, I just won't get a present for you. And you know what we do sometimes? We complain, we complain, we complain, and we complain, and we complain. We complain about what a, what a bother the Christmas season is to us. Maybe we complain about what an inconvenience the Christmas season is to us. And usually around that time, what you'll find is, you know, me sitting in my office all by myself. You know, the kids are asking mommy, hey, where's daddy? And Andrea's saying, oh, don't bother daddy. He's getting back into the Christmas spirit. <laughs> you know, and it's right around that time that I always feel like the Holy Spirit is kind of nudging me. Right around those times, I always feel like the Holy Spirit just kind of speaks to me. Not like in a creepy, audible way, but the Holy Spirit just kind of reminds me that maybe the Christmas isn't really all about me. Because if it were about me, maybe it'd be called a Merry Markmas or something. But it's not called Merry Markmas, it's called Merry Christmas. And if I've lost a sense of wonder and awe and excitement when it comes to the Christmas time, maybe it's because I've allowed the enemy to take my eyes off of the giver and to place them on the gifts themselves. See, and, and you have to understand, like, I'm not even necessarily asking you, do you have a lot of holiday cheer? <laughs> I'm not even necessarily asking you, are you really happy around this time? And do you wear red and green a lot? And do you buy a lot of peppermint mochas at Starbucks? That's not what I'm asking here. I'm asking you this question. Does the Christmas season really lead your heart closer to God? Does it lead you to a greater sense of worship during the Christmas season? You can't help but to lift your hands and worship up to God. Does the Christmas season make you want to be generous during the this time? Does the Christmas season make you want to spend more time in God's word? That's what we're talking about. And maybe for you, maybe you don't necessarily feel openly hostile towards Christmas, but maybe you've just been a Christian for a while, and maybe you just feel kind of apathetic when it comes to the Christmas. And you've kind of, as a Christian, you've been born in the church, you were raised in the church. That's not me, but maybe that's you. Maybe you kind of feel like, I've already kind of been there. I've already done that. And instead of finding ourselves growing up in the Lord, we find ourselves just kind of growing older in the Lord. Becoming a little bit more jaded. Becoming a little bit more cynical. I've already been there. I've already done that. I've already gone to Christmas services in the past. Bah humbug. I already invited people to church in the past. I've already given money to your stupid Christmas offerings. Bah humbug. And um, 
And all of a sudden, the Christmas isn't really a time of reflection. The Christmas isn't a time where, where we marvel at the fact that God would drape himself in human flesh, give his life for someone like us. All of a sudden, we're not looking back at the past year, being so thankful for how God has been faithful to us. All of a sudden, Christmas is just another day. You know what I think is funny about us as Christians, if you call yourself a Christian today? You know what I think is funny? I think what's funny about us Christians is that we get so hot and bothered about the funniest things. That we have a tendency to think that, you know what, this world would be such a better place if Starbucks would start serving drinks in the right cup. That if Starbucks would get their act together, well then this world would be a better place. That if the schools would stop, you know, saying that the teachers can't say Merry Christmas, then of course this world would be a better place. If Target just allowed Christmas carols in their shops, of course this world would be a better place. You know what I think is the biggest danger to Christmas? I think Christians are the biggest danger to Christmas. Christians who take the most momentous day in all of redemptive history, and instead of using that as an opportunity to worship God, you know what we do? We just say, you know what? It's just another day. We communicate that by our actions. If we get our act together as the church, this is what I think, man, the world would be such a better place just from that. Why don't you look at verses 11 and 12 with me. Verses 11 and 12, it talks about the Magi and it says this, On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary and they bowed down and they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Who are these magi to begin with? We don't really know very much about these guys. Some people have pondered that maybe that there are three kings. And it's mostly because of the Christmas carols. We three kings of Orient are. Yeah, and, and this is what we don't know. We don't know that there are three of them because the Bible doesn't say that there are three of them. In fact, we don't even know that they're kings because the Bible doesn't say that they're kings. What the Bible tells us is that these are magi coming from the root word magicians. And so they're probably religious leaders of some sort from the area of Babylon. That is what we know. Babylon being modern day Iraq. So I'm going to make a contemporary analogy for you. Babylon was not an area that was known to worship God. And so a modern day equivalent of something like this would be this. That there were three religious leaders from Iraq. That there were three religious leaders from Syria. Maybe even three religious leaders, I don't know, from ISIS coming to worship the baby Jesus. That they would walk 900 miles. Why would they walk 900 miles the entire length of California in order to go see this baby? And while you and I might think that these people would come and do this child harm, what we come to see is that the Bible is teaching us this one principle, and that is this, that God is working in the hearts of the most unsuspecting people that come from the most unsuspecting places. And so maybe you today, maybe you kind of feel like I don't belong in church because you don't know what I've done and that there is nothing that I could do to please God or to honor him. And the very fact that the Magi came to worship God and that, that by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit has been encapsulated in scriptures says that you know what, that you do have something to offer God because the worship of God oftentimes comes from the most unsuspecting people that come from the most unsuspecting places. You know what, that maybe today you would go that there's no way that I'd invite this person to come to our Christmas services because there's no way that they would come. And what we don't know is this, that God may be working in that person's heart. You can't see what God is doing behind the scenes. 
Because this is what we learn from scripture that sometimes God is working in the most unsuspecting people that come from the most unsuspecting places because here you have three men who most probably don't even worship the same God. They're being led by the way of a star to come to the feet of Jesus. And they come to worship him. The Bible says this, that they bring gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold representing the fact that he is king. Frankincense representing the fact that he is God. And myrrh pointing to the fact that this God will suffer and die for our sins. The question that I want to ask you today is this, that in the midst of all of your busy Christmas shopping, you're going to get gifts for your kids, you're going to get gifts for your spouse, you're going to get gifts for your pets probably. Here's a, here's a question that I have for you. What, what gift are you going to give Jesus this year? Now that sounds kind of cheesy. That sounds kind of pastor-like, doesn't it? You know, what gifts are you going to give Jesus this year? But you know what, today I don't really have to sell you on the idea that you give gifts to the people that you love. I don't have to sell that idea on you. Today I just have to remind you that you love Jesus. And we give gifts to the people that we love. Now you probably think that it's about this time that I'm going to give you a sales pitch on the Christmas offering. And that this is a great opportunity for you to give gifts to Jesus and that, you know, that your gift can go towards, I don't know, providing a roof over a head for a missionary. But I ain't going to talk about that. Probably think that I'm going to talk about, you know, that if you give a Christmas gift to the offering that, you know, that, that you can help provide a house for babies who don't have one. I'm not going to talk about that one either. You know what I want to talk about? I don't want to talk about what you can do for the church. I want to talk about what the church wants to do for you today. Oh, now all of a sudden that got your attention. Because the church, we want to remind you of the fact that like, that Christmas is about giving. And that Christmas is about generosity. When we saw Keith and Shelley's expression that they're going to so wonderfully reproduce in second service today. When, when we saw their expression, we went, yeah, that's what Christmas is really all about. You remember, uh, for those of you who aren't here, you remember when we cash mobbed somebody about a month ago? For those of you do, who don't know what I'm talking about, we met this lady in the community online, actually. But that's how everybody's meeting these days. <laughs> we met this lady online who was saying that she was just having a difficult time this Christmas, and she wasn't asking for a handout. She was asking for a hand up. She was asking for, hey, does anybody have some odd jobs where I can make some money? It's been kind of a difficult time. All of us have been through those kind of times. And so you know what we did as a church? We had Monique call her and lie to her. <laughs> now, I know we just did a series on the Ten Commandments, but still, God, you're going to have to forgive us on that one. Um, and we lied to her saying that, that Monique was going to meet her in the East Vale Gateway and we were just going to simply present her with a little Thanksgiving basket. But that's not what really happened. We had about 200 Vantage Point people waiting in the wings. And when she met Monique, Pastor Tom came and Tom slapped down a bucket. And all of a sudden he said, the people of Vantage Point Church want to help you this Christmas because our mission is to be living proof of a loving God. And so all of a sudden, 200 people came from all over the place and we started slapping down fives and tens and twenties. And there were, the, the bucket was overflowing. There were tears. There were hugs. There, were, there was snot rolling down people's faces. It was amazing. And for me, one of the most amazing parts of it was this, that collectively, that we were able to do something that not one of us could have done individually. Let me say that one more time, that collectively, that we were able to do something that we could not do individually. And so today, in order to really kind of prime the pump of generosity, you know what we're going to do? We're going to pass the buckets around twice today. No, but that's actually what we're going to do. The first time we pass around the bucket after the sermon, we're going to receive our normal tithes and offerings. But here's what we're going to do with the bucket that's going to come after that. 
With the bucket that comes after that, you will see an entire bucket that's filled with envelopes that either have a $5 bill, a $10 bill, or a $20 bill in it. And we want each and every one of you here to take one. Okay, now don't keep it, because I'm pretty sure that God will strike you down if you keep it. Oh my gosh, it's like playing the Powerball at this point, right? Come on, God, give me a 20. Give me a 20. And here's what we want you to do with the understanding that Christmas is all about giving. That we as a church want to partner with you guys to go out, to take that money, and to do a random act of kindness in Jesus' name with it. That's right, that's what we're going to do. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to go buy the drink of the person behind you in the drive drive through lane at the Starbucks. I want you to go buy a, a movie ticket for somebody else who may be beside you at the time. You know what I had the opportunity to do? Last week, after the San Bernardino shooting, I decided that this was going to be the way that I fight the war on terror. That I was going to fight the war on terror with a war of kindness. And so I was at this uh, Vietnamese restaurant. I was going to make a racial comment, but I probably should. <laughs> I'm growing spiritually. And I said, waiter, waiter, can you come here for a second? Because you see those guys over there in the corner table? They really look like they need Jesus. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going I'm I'm to pay for their entire meal. I want, I want you to put it on my bill. And I just want you to say that God loves them. Can you do that? Yeah, he, he was amazed. And so that's what, that's what we want you to do. We want you to take that. I know it's not going to cover everything. Because maybe it's the cynical, bah humbug, Scrooge part of you today. That's going to say, well, what's a five going to do? What's a 10 going to do? What's a 20 going to do? It's not really going to do all that much. But you know what it's going to do? It's going to provide just a little bit of light, just a little bit of light, and a whole lot of darkness. Because sometimes somebody just needs something to go right for them this Christmas season. Sometimes they just need to know that somebody else loves them. And yes, we're not going to solve the war on terror with this. We're not going to solve the issue of homelessness in our community. But this is what I think. This is what I think. That collectively, maybe we'll be able to do something that none of us could do individually. So there's even a little card that says, hey, this is our way of saying that God loves you. No strings attached. Because maybe somebody else needs to know that this Christmas season. Maybe you need to be reminded of that this Christmas season. Why don't you bow your heads and pray with me. Father God, we're just excited about what you're doing in our midst. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for this Christmas, Lord God. And in the midst of all of the weirdness and in the midst of um, all the present buying and everything, Lord Jesus, we just... Thank you, God, for this momentary time where we can focus our hearts on you. And Jesus, as we even um, enter into a time of worship, Lord God, we pray that even as we worship, that it would remind us, Lord God, of what the Christmas season is all about. That, Father, that as the wise men have come to worship you, Father, that we have come here to worship you as well, Lord God. And Father, as all of us are being equipped to go out there to do an act of kindness, Lord Jesus. This is what I pray, that we would not, as a church, underestimate the power of one little seed, Lord. Because this is what we know even from your word, Father, that sometimes even from the tiniest little seed, Father, that the greatest, from the tiniest mustard seed, Father, that the greatest of faith can come from that. And so, Father, as we go out armed to do all of these acts of kindness, Father, we pray that, Lord, that you would change our community. That, and in the process of changing our community, that you would change us as well. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this time. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen.